Hi everyone, you're with Tesla Tom, and thank you very much for joining us on Ludicrous Feed on this glorious spring day. Yes, we are finally free from the clutches of winter here in Sydney, Australia. It is indeed the first day of September, and traditionally also the first day of spring in Sydney, which makes it timely for me to present to you my monthly snapshot of how my Tesla Powerwall 2 has performed in August. Before I get into the numbers, I just wanted to thank all of you for supporting my channel and helping me to pass 1,300 subscribers. Your support over this last year has been phenomenal, and I cannot thank you all enough. If you haven't done so already, please take a moment to hit that subscribe button to stay up to date with our latest videos. Okay, so as always, here are a few facts about my household to give you some context. I live in Sydney, Australia, which lies on the 33rd Southern Parallel, or Latitude. For comparison, Los Angeles is 34 degrees north. New York is situated on the 40th parallel, while London lies on the 51st degree north. I live in a two-storey, five-bedroom home which houses four of us, including two children under the age of 10. I have a 3 kilowatt solar array coupled with a 13.5 kilowatt hour Tesla Powerwall 2 battery. In August, I ran the pool pump for four hours every alternate day. We still had the heaters on overnight, depending on how cold it got. And as I mentioned earlier, August is considered the final month of winter in Sydney. These data have been obtained from the Tesla app on my iPhone, outlining how my Solar and Powerwall 2 have performed in August. Overall, my house was self-powered 48% of the time, with Solar providing direct power 18% of the time, while any excess was used to charge the Powerwall 2, which then provided the remaining 30% of the household's energy requirement. Now keep in mind that sometimes, using the Powerwall 2's advanced mode, the Powerwall 2 may have, on some days, charged from the grid at off-peak rates overnight, during times when it knew that the next day would be cloudy or overcast. So of that self-powered number of 48%, some of that may actually be from the grid at off-peak rates to be used during at-peak times. I don't have the exact figure, but I'm sure it's not a large percentage. Moving along, interestingly, the last week in August I think really affected the overall picture for the month. The first half of August was actually quite warm, while the latter half was colder and windier. So as you can see, in the final week of August, the house was only 30% self-powered compared to the overall pattern for the whole month. I think that also affected the overall picture for 2018 thus far. I now sit at 60% self-powered for the year, 18% directly from solar, while 42% being directly from the Powerwall 2. Interestingly, at the end of July, I was sitting at 63%. I would guess that by my next snapshot by the end of September, that number really should head closer to 70%, given that September really does warm up quite nicely in Sydney. Okay, let's do a quick comparison between July and August, and here's where I found some interesting facts while I was looking at the data, which I will share with you now. There's quite a lot to process here, so I'll spend a bit of time on the slide, and I ask that you bear with me while we go through this. So between July and August, there wasn't too much difference in how self-powered my house was, July being 46% while August was 48%. In terms of direct solar contribution, July fared better being 20% versus 18% in August. I'll explain why shortly when we look further down the table in a minute. There was a significant difference in power or two output, July being 26% versus August at 30%. And I think the next couple of rows explain why this occurred. Check out the daily average temperatures for both months. The average high temperature between July and August was similar, 19.9 degrees Celsius versus 19.2 degrees Celsius. However, when you look at the average low between the two months, July's low was 8.4 degrees Celsius, while August was 9.5 degrees Celsius. That's more than a whole degree Celsius, or two degrees Fahrenheit, between the two months. Ultimately, for my household, that extra degree of warmth in August overnight meant that the heaters probably weren't used as much this month when compared to last. Whether we altered the thermostat or altered the timers so they came on for less hours, overall less energy was required to heat the house given the milder nights. This translated to the Powerwall 2 quote unquote lasting longer through the night, meaning less electricity needed to be imported from the grid to top up the heating requirements. It's interesting how much difference one degree can make. What makes it even more fascinating is the next row, which show that July actually had slightly more sunshine than August, averaging 8.6 hours per day versus August's 8.2 hours per day. Sure, there is more sunshine to help charge the power or two in July, but because there is only a finite amount of energy that can be stored in the battery, namely 13.5 kilowatt hours, if you're using more heating overnight because it's colder with lower average low temperatures, then the Powerwall 2 is going to run out of juice regardless of how much sunshine you get during the day. 
Anyway, I find that all very fascinating. I hope you do as well. So in summary, sure, our winters are mild here in Sydney compared to other places in the United States and Europe, but I suppose Sydney is a good case study of how solar and batteries can work just because our winters are mild and we still get a reasonable amount of sunshine compared to elsewhere in the world, even in winter. If you invest in solar and battery in Sydney, you can expect to be self-powered 50% of the time. As I mentioned earlier with regards to comparing July and August, August had less sunshine, but July had lower average low temperatures. So having crunched the data, the critical factor for how self-powered your household can be really depends on how low your low temperatures go overnight. This ultimately leads to an increase in your heating requirements, making your power wall to less effective, which then leads to an increased reliance on the grid. I guess when you break it down like that, it makes a lot of sense, but it's good to see the data on paper, so to speak. Alright guys, I hope you enjoyed that little presentation. Please feel free to leave a comment or to ask a question about the power wall too. I've had my battery now for over a year. I had it installed in August 2017 and we were one of the first households in Australia to have one installed. So I now probably am about as qualified as they come to clarify any general questions you have about the system. It really is a beautiful day here in Sydney. I'm personally thankful that spring has finally arrived. Hope it's lovely wherever you are in this wonderful world of ours. And as always, happy charging. Thanks for watching and thanks for being part of the energy revolution. If you haven't done so already, be sure to hit subscribe to keep up to date with our latest videos. If you're about to buy a Tesla, use our promo code on screen to score free unlimited supercharging. Happy charging!